want to switch slides for us? Oh. Oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you this is this one, right? Yeah. Okay. There you go. Okay, so the tortoise, the hare, and how that relates with the dynamics. And it's by Kush, Atharva, me, and Shana. So for the original ending of the fable, we have the hare gets off to a fast start, and that's the initial acceleration, which is greater than the tortoise's acceleration. It moves at a constant speed, so the acceleration is zero. The hare sees that the tortoise won't catch up, so it has incorrect body analysis. The hare assumes that the tortoise won't um, speed up or won't change. It just, it just thinks it has a big lead. And then the hare slows and decides to take a nap. It decelerates to v equals zero. Then the tortoise overtakes the hare and doesn't stop. So there's no path deviation. The tortoise continues on the same path. And then the tortoise wins, utilizing that constant velocity throughout the trip. Uh, so we found the first alternate ending of the fable, which was the hare realizes his mistake. Uh, he shouldn't have slept. So that's the evaluation of the solution process. Um, and he asked the tortoise to race again, so completing an iteration uh, of the solution process. Now this time the hare doesn't stop throughout the race, um, so he uses a new methodology to fix his mistakes. Um, he runs faster than the tortoise, of course, um, again compar comparing the change in uh, position over change in time, the hare has a greater velocity. Uh, and then, of course, the hare wins easily. And this is the effective uh, problem solving process being at work. All right, now the tortoise is a little bit fed up with these results and he wants to win. So he decides to uh, ask the hare to race again. And he knows that he can't win on ground because obviously the hare is faster. So he sees he can't win the race on speed. That's an evaluation of his own weaknesses. So he decides to change the actual route of the race. So he's reiterating the setup of the problem. He chooses a path across a river. So it's setting up the problem to your strengths and what you know you can actually do. Um, the race begins. You're starting your new solution process. The hare starts off strong, but can't cross the river. So he's got a higher initial acceleration, but his technique limits his solving process. The tortoise, however, is able to very quickly cross the river. It correctly proved his reevaluation and then the tortoise wins the race. So the conclusion of that is that rethinking a problem in a different way can yield a better or more optimal result. So this is the last alternate ending of the, of the fable. So they decide to, they decide to become friends, um, which is a suggestion to the solution, a suggestion, a solution. Um, then they decide to divide the race up. So the tortoise, uh, the tortoise takes the river area while the hare takes the forest area. Um, yeah, wait, sorry. They decide to have a relay race that covers the forest and the river. So they change the, the problem outlook. The hare decides to run the forest the tortoise decides to swim the river. This utilizes their different strengths to achieve their common goal, which is to complete the race at, uh, at a faster speed. They begin the race. This is running a new solution process. And the hare hands a baton off to the tortoise. This is dividing the solution process. And then they finish the race with record time. New result for a problem.
like we were researching obviously we all know the original ending but we did like research on what are some popular alternate endings and then to actually get initially started on relating dynamics to the story we used chat gpt on the first ending um, so we could see like kind of what are some good ideas some foundational uh, concepts that we could include and then from there we all kind of divided up the work so each person was kind of in charge of one of the endings um, and then we reviewed it all together made sure everything worked and arrived at this Can you see if some of you can help me push this towards the this end? Over a steam tech. That should do. Come again? No, I think that's fine. Yeah. I think we uh, went through most of this uh, in the previous class itself, but I'll try to see if uh, we can uh, add to what I uh, said over there. Um, I've already uh, put this file onto uh, your MS team. Uh, were any of you able to see it or access it? So all of you are now able to access your team, right? MS Microsoft team. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'll be uploading the files including the um, uh, links to the video recording as well as uh, uh, the uh, slides for that particular class. So, of course, uh, what I write on the uh, view board will probably not be there, but just the base, uh, basic slides, bare slides will be there. Okay, so mm, I think we've covered most of this. Uh, let me just go forward. Yeah. So this is uh, something that I really want to, you to keep in mind as a mnemonic, uh, the mass into acceleration as a force, uh, because um, many uh, students get confused between these two words, uh, kinetics and kinematics, which involves the force and which doesn't. So this involves it implicitly, and this in involves the force explicitly. So that is the uh, primary difference, and that's why we study kinematics first, and which is a description of the motion, primarily focusing on the geometry, and then we will get on to the uh, effect of the force, which also means that um, uh, things like mass and also uh, the moment of inertia are topics that we will be considering uh, just before we, we enter kin kinetics, because that's uh, something that is useful there, but doesn't appear at all uh, when you're talking of kinematics. And um, in the case of particles, it's very clear that just the motion can be entirely described by uh, the position coordinates of uh, that particular point or particle. But uh, when you talk of a body, uh, you know, uh, whether it's a rigid body or a flexible body, our focus is on rigid bodies. But in either case, 
uh, you have uh, essentially a set of infinite number of particles which make up that rigid body, which are all connected to each other in the sense that uh, the distance between them does not change. So uh, that is essentially what it is. But um, luckily, there's a way to uh, handle this because you don't need to deal with this, uh, this as an infinite degree of freedom problem. Uh, you just identify one particular point. Usually, it's very convenient to identify that uh, to be the mass center. And then you track that as if you were tracking a particle. So you know the location of the body. But in addition to that, it also has to have its orientation specified. So you have uh, three degrees of freedom of the rigid body associated with translation, uh, rectilinear translation that is. And then you have uh, three more which are associated with the rotation. So once you identify the mass center, you typically uh, will um, bring in a frame of reference which is fixed to the body. And that frame of reference will typically be having its origin uh, for the coordinate system at the uh, mass center so that the rotations about each one of those three uh, mutually perpendicular axes will become the three rotations that we are interested in. And uh, of course, we could do a coordinate transformation and things like that. We will look at some of those things, uh, why they are essential and when they are useful, uh, how they make certain problems, uh, which seemingly are complex, much simpler when you go to a different um, direction for the uh, coordinate system. Uh, for the, once again, the body fixed uh, coordinate system. Now, uh, coming to the, uh, uh, once we have done with uh, the description of the motion, uh, which is essentially the kinematics, and we uh, get into the kinetics, uh, we will see that as far as the uh, rectilinear translations are concerned, they are uh, having a one is to one correspondence with the mass when we get into the kinetics, because mass into velocity, for example, is a translational momentum, uh, you know, half mv squared, for example, you know, it's kinetic energy. So anything that is associated with a particle or uh, a point in the rigid body, its motion is in terms of its velocity and, and the way it uh, typically contributes to the energies, uh, in particular the kinetic energy, is in terms of uh, the mass. Whereas uh, we also saw that it has three additional degrees of freedom when we go to the body, which means that there are rotations as well. And corresponding to uh, translations, you have a rectilinear or translational velocity. And similarly, corresponding to a rotation, wh when you look at it, how it changes with respect to time, corresponding to a particular reference frame, then you essentially talk of, instead of uh, translational rectilinear velocities, you talk of angular velocities, which again is a concept that you're familiar from high school. Uh, and of course, the uh, derivative once again gives you angular acceleration, just like uh, the uh, translational velocity gives you uh, the rectilinear or translational uh, acceleration as well. Now, coming to the uh, kinetics of the rigid body, you typically have uh, in um, analogy to the mass for the translational motions, you have what is known as a uh, inertia matrix, essentially you're talking of. Uh, the moments of the mass inertia uh, or products of the mass inertia, there is an asymmetry and we will see how uh, those things are contributing to the energy as well. So it is possible that the mass center of a body is not moving at all, but because of the rotations which changing with respect to time, it is possible that there is a contribution to the um, angular uh, velocity, angular momentum and angular uh, uh, the uh, kinetic energy associated with this angular motion. And um, we also saw um, two a little more uh, relatively advanced topics, uh, how they come in. Both are coming in through the integration of that equation f is equal to ma. Uh, one is with respect to the uh, distance, the other is with respect to the time. And um, very interestingly, if you look at, let me So, it responds better to my finger, I guess. So, uh, we saw this, this is a vector equation, and uh, we will also introduce certain notations now. So, typically, as I said in your uh, textbook, uh, 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 we don't have a textbook, but uh, all your reference books, 
you will see that uh, this is typically done in bold. Uh, it will be very inconvenient to do that uh, in the uh, on the board. It will take too much of time. So uh, essentially, we will not use that kind of uh, notation. But you should be uh, familiar with this uh, notation when you're uh, referring to books or papers. Um, uh, the way we will be re referring to it is through an underline, but uh, you also know that there are certain other places where this might be written in the form of an arrow that uh, on the top. And um, so that the, these are essentially what uh, you need to be aware of. The other thing, and we will see it in a little more detail as we go forward, this particular acceleration is a time derivative of the velocity vector. And you see that um, the numerator, or the quantity whose derivative we are taking, is a vector velocity is a vector, whereas uh, the quantity with respect to which we are taking the derivative over here is a scalar. Okay. So now, uh, this uh, fact that you are usually familiar in calculus of taking a derivative of, let's say, a function df by dx, where f is a scalar function of x you are very familiar with uh, this particular uh, notation of a scalar derivative with respect to another scalar quantity. But what we, and of course one is a dependent and the other is an independent variable. But here uh, the only change in going from here to here is that the quantity whose derivative we are taking now is a vector and therefore there is a, a very important thing that you need to mention when you take this into account. For example, if you, let's say, uh, we were talking of this uh, rigid body, let's say we have a rigid body which we will call as B, and then uh, we will also have an inertial frame of reference which we will call as A. So we will have a coordinate system associated with A. Uh, let's say we have an origin over here. Um, we have x1, x2, and um, to be familiar with the right-hand thumb rule that you have over here triad like this, x3. So, uh, in the say, uh, unit vectors, e1, small b2, and small b3, which are associated with uh, these three directions, uh, then um, for a dextral triad or a right-handed triad, you would see that your uh, B3 should be equal to B1 cross B2 by definition. Um, because you know that this cross product, uh, if you interchange these two, in other words, if I put it as B2 cross B1, it would become the negative of B1 cross B2. Uh, so that's how the cross product works. And therefore, once B1 and B2 are fixed, you know that B3 is going to be uh, perpendicular to that plane, orthogonal to that plane, but uh, you still have uh, an uncertainty in terms of to this plane, is B3 coming in this direction or this direction? So only the sign of B3 uh, remains unknown and therefore you take this uh, cyclic order 1, 2, 3 or similarly B2 cross B3 will be B1 and B3 cross B1 will be B2. So if you cyclically rotate across them, you know that uh, you will still remain uh, positive. But if you reverse that order, for uh, example, if I put it at B2 cross B1, then I have to include a negative sign over here uh, if I want to maintain the triad as a dextral triad by dextral a right-handed rule, and which is why uh, we use this typical thumb rule. Um, uh, my advisor, Dewey Hodges, who used to teach dynamics, used to uh, say that um, in the exam, um, uh, everybody is looking at their paper and all of them are trying to uh, uh, find out what is happening and there was one student who raised the hand and uh, asked Professor Hodges, um, 
everybody is uh, doing this. What, what does that mean? I don't know. So <laughs> then he said, then you don't fit into this class. So it, it's that important. So in the sense that um, it's very, very, because uh, a fine change can completely mess up your entire derivation because you're going to probably adding this or subtracting it from other quantities and algebraic sums will get completely affected uh, once you have um, a, a mistake in one of these signs. So be very, very careful uh, about uh, this particular thing. Now, uh, this is, let's say, an inertial frame of reference that we talked about uh, in the previous class. frame of reference we will uh, denote with uh, capital F and capital R with a small o in between and uh, let's call this particular thing as let's say A or uh, because I've introduced the B system over here let me call this as B instead. Uh, so the body B is associated with the unit vectors B1, B2, B3. Let me just call this uh, this as instead the body A that we are uh, interested in. And that could be some body over here, which is moving, as I said. Um, it has six degrees of freedom. So it has a translation u1, which is along x1 and b1. So we call that as u1. Um, similarly, it has a translation u2, which is along x2 and b2, and u3, which is along x3 or b3, right? Now, um, if you're looking at how to uh, look at the position of this mass center of A, we'll call that, let's say, over here is the so point uh, A star. Uh, uh, so typically, um, you might have it at the geometric center if it's a uniform mass distribution and a very regular shape like a sphere or cylinder, etc. But when you have an arbitrary shape like that and also the uh, it's made out of, let's say, different materials, um, then uh, the mass densities will come in for the weightage and therefore it could be not necessarily at the so-called geometric center. Uh, it, uh, depending upon the densities of the different materials that are involved and uh, their distributions. So we are interested in the position of this particular point A star from the origin O. So we typically draw a vector over here and that is called as a position vector. So that's a very, very important concept uh, in dynamics and uh, we will use certain notations and also I will also introduce a few notations, other notations probably which are used in books that you might uh, lay your hands on. So uh, the notation that we will use for this position vector of point A star uh, with respect to O is we will use R or uh, typically for the position vector and we will put the position vector of the point that we are interested in on the right hand side as a superscript and we will put the point with respect to which this is there on the left hand side as a superscript. So this is So this is uh, the notation that we will use and um, you will see uh, uh, common to th uh, uh, this particular quantity uh, other notations being used elsewhere in references. One is um, let us say you might have it as R O A star. Uh, people might also write it instead of a superscript as a subscript. Uh, so that is uh, one way in which it could be written. Um, there are also people who write it as the position vector of A star. They put a slash and say O, A star with respect to O. Okay? So don't get confused between these notations uh, uh, when you consult books uh, or read papers, etc. All these things uh, mean exactly the same thing. 
And um, the reason that we are introducing all of this uh, right now uh, is because we were talking about this particular uh, quantity when we are saying that when we want to take uh, get the acceleration, we need the velocity. And the velocity, in turn, is defined in terms of this uh, position vector. So uh, you would have your velocity vector v. Uh, once again, we would talk about the velocity of a particular point, in this case A star, with respect to a particular frame of reference. Okay, So in this case, uh, we are having a frame of reference, which is the inertial frame of reference B that we are calling over here. So we would have velocity of A star with respect to B. So now you see a very important difference between um, the reference as far as uh, position is concerned and the reference as far as uh, velocity is concerned. And that's a very important piece for that. I cannot put this as O. I have to write it as B. The reason is that the velocity itself, just like the acceleration was a time derivative, the velocity is also a time derivative of the corresponding position vector, which is of A star with respect to O, a point which is fixed in B. Okay, so O is a point O is fixed in B. So O is a point which is fixed in B and uh, so your uh, position vector of A star uh, with respect to O you are taking its time derivative. And whenever we take a time derivative, it is very important to say with respect to which frame of reference are you taking the time derivative. So in other words, I will put A over here. So in other words, sorry, B. B over here because it's with respect to frame B that we are taking the um, uh, time derivative. And this is um, this particular um, concept is valid irrespective of whether you're taking a derivative with respect to time or some other parameter, let's say a distance, etc., any scalar quantity for that matter. So all that we are looking at is two common kinds of derivatives, a derivative of a vector with respect to a scalar. Here also a derivative of a vector with respect to a scalar. So when I say this, I have to very clearly specify with respect to what frame of reference I'm taking this derivative. Yes, please. There are two things over here. One is uh, the mathematics, and the other is the uh, dynamics or physics that we are talking about here. From the mathematics point of view, we are looking at any vector when you're taking a derivative with respect to a scalar. There are two things that you need to specify. One is, of course, what is that scalar with respect to which you're taking the derivative, and in which frame are you taking that derivative? Okay. So this frame that you're taking the derivative with respect to in this case is the frame B. For example, if I want to take that derivative with respect to frame A, what would it be? Can you say something? If I want to take the derivative of uh, the position vector with respect to time t, or any parameter for that matter, instead of B over here, I want to take the derivative with respect to A. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's a very, very important point. It might. S Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. It sounds trivial, but mm, uh, I mean, this is a complication that you could get into once in a while if you don't uh, have it as almost a back of uh, because it's very, very essential 
that you see with respect to which frame are you taking the frame. So, so uh, that itself is a good example that you give that when you're talking about uh, this derivative, there are two examples that we could take now, uh, derivative with respect to frame A, derivative with respect to frame B. Obviously, they're not necessarily equal to each other, unless and, and until, of course, A is not having any motion at all, in which case both are zeros. Uh, but otherwise, you will have to take that into account. There's another way in which um, we can think of uh, the same thing uh, in terms of the, um, uh, the mathematical reason for this, because you know that this position vector uh, r star of uh, a, uh, sorry, r of a star with respect to O can be written as x1 b1 plus x2 b2 plus x3 b3, right? Now, if I take the derivative of that, maybe I'll clear this more. Can I remove this? Because once I touch this, everything will go. Okay. Yeah. So your position vector, remember, of Talking of a position vector, uh, oops. Uh, I had a pen over here, but it seems to be uh, some damage because of which it's not working. Okay, that's good. Okay, so uh, this position vector of um, a, a star with respect to uh, O is what we were looking at, uh, and that is equal to x i b i. Once again, engineers are lazy. So there is an implied summation over here. Whenever there is a repeated index, that means the same index i appears on two quantities, then there is an implied summation. What it essentially means is that if this notation is called Einstein's summation convention, so we blame for our laziness on Einstein over the entire range of i. In this case, we know we are dealing with a three-dimensional spatial um, system or uh, domain. And therefore, the summation is over i equal to 1 to 3. And um, there's no need to explicitly write the sigma i equal to 1 to 3. As soon as you see that one particular index is being then you, uh, you use this. It's important to remember this uh, entire range because we are going to be considering two types of bodies. Uh, initially, we'll be talking of uh, planar motion, and we will later on be talking of 3D, though I'm introducing everything in 3D right now. Initial focus of the first few lectures from next time onwards will be on um, uh, planar motion, in which case we will be only bothered about two coordinates. Let's say if it's the motion is happening in the plane x1, x2, then uh, those are the two directions. And therefore, the summation instead of i equal to 1 to 3 would be i equal to 1 to 2. So you should be um, clear about the fact that whichever index is repeated uh, and uh, its entire range uh, depends on uh, what, what uh, specific uh, kind of problem you're dealing with. Um, it could even be a much simpler uh, case where you're dealing with a one-dimensional motion. Uh, so just let's say a uh, train traveling on a uh, track, uh, even if the track is actually curving, you can actually say that it's a one-dimensional path that is it's essentially because if it's fixed to that path and that path itself is defined, I know the function, how it varies uh, with respect to each point. So 
then um, I can just use a curve instead of a straight line. Okay. So, in other words, uh, uh, there is a possibility of instead of introducing coordinate systems like this, where of course there is a mutual orthogonality between uh, sorry, these. So, in uh, addition, you could also have, let's say, a curve like this or like this, which is which may or may not necessarily be orthogonal to each other, but they are not parallel to each other either. So you have what is known as a curvilinear coordinate system. We will not be using too much of this, but uh, it is important to be aware of that. Because the whole idea uh, of uh, introducing this Mm, uh, starting from the time of Descartes, uh, is, uh, which is why we call uh, the uh, right-handed dextral triad system as a Cartesian coordinate system in his honor, Descartes. Uh, so, he's a scientist mathematician who introduced uh, this concept, but um, uh, for many uh, problems, uh, you, you may uh, find it more convenient not to have right -handed but at the same time, you cannot have it as a zero degree. In other words, they cannot in any two axes cannot be collinear. Okay, so one is uh, there are two changes that we are making here. One is the possibility that we are no longer dealing with orthogonal uh, systems. In other words, we are dealing with non-orthogonal nonetheless, it is non-collinear and if you are looking at a 3D space it might be not collinear uh, these might be the three axes that I choose then again it is still not valid why? yeah exactly so I can't uh, distinguish a point which is away from this plane how, how much it is away on which side of the plane it is so uh, when you are talking of um, uh, two axes you have to say non-collinear, uh, uh, which means that they cannot be parallel to each other, um, either uh, passing one through the other or uh, even parallel at a distance from each other. That is non-collinear. Um, so in other words, they have to make an angle, which is non-zero degrees. Uh, the other thing is, as you uh, very uh, correctly said, non-planar. So in other words, they all cannot be on the same plane. So that is one aspect that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. So in other words, let's say a planar motion, I can have um, these two as the axis. I can still get any points coordinate system uh, very uniquely, right? So in other words, I can distinguish one point from the other just by giving it a coordinate system like uh, uh, axis like this. I'm uh, based on that. I'm giving the coordinates. So let's say I'm measuring x1 along this, x2 along this. You very clearly you can see these are not at 90 degrees to each other. But of course they are not collinear either, non non zero, non 90. So these are non orthogonal coordinate systems that you can have, and um, uh, you might as well. Uh, have as much uh, liberty uh, or uh, freedom in terms of uh, expressing the position vectors of any particular point in space in that domain uh, with respect to any one of these coordinate systems. Um, it may not be very clear to you as to why um, these could be useful, but as we uh, in the future we will take up a few examples where we will see that some of these uh, coordinate systems might be more uh, convenient or uh, lead to simpler formulations and expressions for various quantities uh, rather than an orthogonal coordinate system, right? So one is the uh, fact that it need not be uh, 90 degrees. Uh, the other, uh, uh, of course, is in terms of it need not be straight lines, okay? So that is why we said uh, curvilinear. Uh, so once again, curvilinear, uh, a special case of that is the uh, linear, which is essentially rectilinear, uh, to be more specific, in the sense that uh, a, a, it essentially forms the uh, edges of a rectangle in plane and uh, the edges of a cuboid in the case of a three-dimensional space that we are interested in, right? So, uh, so all of these uh, possibilities are there. 
but uh, in this particular case, let's say we are sticking to our dextral triad, a Cartesian coordinate system. In other words, uh, B1, B2, and B3 are orthogonal to each other. They are unit vectors. In other words, their magnitudes are equal to one. So when we say, so these are all uh, things that you're familiar with, of course, from your linear algebra course, but uh, it's important. So uh, we need to review a uh, few of these things. So all those three quantities, which are vectors b i, are of magnitude one, right? So just that they are, um, and the fact that they are not orthogonal or non-planar, how would you say that in a mathematical sense? What is the relation between, let's say, a b one and b two? When I say b one and b two are neither zero degrees nor uh, ninety degrees to each other. What is uh, it? How how can I specify that mathematically in terms of b1 and b2? Come again? Uh huh. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's right, you're, you're on the right path. So essentially, if I have these two as orthogonal to each other, let's say B1 and B2. So let's say they are at 90 degrees to each other. So in that case, what is B1 dot B2? Yeah. Right? And if they were collinear, Leave out non over here. If they were collinear, then what would this dot product be? One, right? Exactly. So if they were collinear, it would be one. If they are uh, non-collinear, uh, I mean orthogonal, they would be zero. So you could have anywhere in between if you want to have non-linear. So essentially, uh, this is something we should not have, okay? Between all of them. So uh, uh, though we wrote for that plane, this is something that is valid for any i and j, right? You could take combination of 1, 2, or 2, 1, 1, 3, 3, 1, 2, 3, 3, 2. So all those six quantities, this particular thing uh, is important to know that uh, in your problem that you want to have, that you want to have it non-collinear, which means that uh, this particular quantity should not be should not be equal to one, right? Because if it is equal to one, you are not able to specify a point x coordinate appropriately with just three coordinates, uh, three coordinate measures, right? So it's very, very important that uh, this distinction is very clearly understood. Um, also, um, uh, there are two uh, nomenclatures which are used almost interchangeably in many, bo even many books and papers, but it is wrong. Uh, these are Anything? Okay. Uh, so, uh, can anybody tell the distinction between these two, or is there uh, a distinction at all? A component of a vector and a measure number of a vector. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so in this case, let's say you have this x1, x2. Of course, I'll be giving away the answer as well, but nonetheless. Uh, the measure numbers for this vector are, are x1, x2, and x3, okay? So uh, can you now say what is what could be the difference? What is the component? Yes, yes, yes. But how uh, mathematically, how are they distinct from each other? The measure numbers for, let's say, uh, r of a star with respect to o, Three 
measure numbers, x1, x2, x3, right? Uh, it's, it's a giveaway in terms of the nomenclature itself. It's essentially a number. So x1, x2, x3 are scalar quantities, right? R is a vector, but its measure numbers are scalar. So it's a very important distinction to make. And this English word component, uh, also you'd be uh, familiar with from other usages of it. If you're saying it's something is a component of something else, uh, essentially they have a similar character or similar uh, dimension or similar units associated with it. In other words, if I say um, F1 uh, is a component of a force F, then F1 also needs to be a force. So in other words, it also needs to be a vector. So components of a vector have to be a vector. So if I take, whereas this is a scalar, so that is one important difference or distinction that we have to maintain and we have to be very, very uh, specific. See, um, uh, this is another thing that uh, will become more and more important as we uh, get into these new methodologies of what you've been using for the previous homework, the um, LLMs, right? So you have to specify things a little more clearly uh, for them to understand. They, uh, we humans might be a little more forgiving in terms of if you interchange, uh, I, okay, I understand what he means by that and probably take that, right? But um, of course, those things can be built into those systems later on, but essentially uh, for efficiency of getting a response based on your prompt, you have to be very, very clear or crisp about how uh, these distinctions are being made. So the components in this case of the same vector that we are interested in, these are its measure numbers are x1, x2, x3. What would be its components? That's correct. So it would be xi. Uh, I cannot say because uh, uh, this, this guy will kick in. So I have to say, list them out explicitly. x1, b1, x2, b2, and x3, b3 are the components that, okay? So you see a very clear distinction. One case I'm using the uh, magnitudes along the three, three directions. The other, uh, I'm actually using the vector. So it also has the same magnitude as the measure number, but in addition, it has an extra bit of information, which is your, um, you know, the direction in which it goes, and therefore it is a vector quantity, not a scalar quantity, right? So uh, this is as far as uh, the uh, planar motion is concerned, motion is concerned, the distinction in terms of introducing an additional coordinate uh, measure, uh, whereas for the planar motion, just two are sufficient, but we have to ensure that they are not collinear. In the other case, you also have to ensure In other words, your x1, x2, x3, as you very clearly pointed out, cannot be all uh, being measured on the same plane. In other words, your b1, b2, and b3 cannot be along the same line, which is why in an orthogonal coordinate system, we uh, very easily see in a dextral triad, b3 equal to b1 cross b2, you know the cross product of any two vectors will always be perpendicular to that. So um, that, that's kind of already taken care of in an orthogonal system, but you uh, have to doubly check for this, especially in a non-orthogonal uh, kind of a system, right? So, but even in a non-orthogonal system, you know that if you've already introduced two vectors, um, you already have formed a plane. It doesn't, these two don't need to necessarily be 90 degrees to each other. Uh, whatever two non-collinear uh, non uh, vectors that you have introduced, they, even if I, instead of like this, I introduce it like this, now I have a plane like this, okay? So it doesn't matter which direction I introduce it, I always have a plane. So that is essentially, and these need not be uh, uh, drawn uh, at the same, passing through the same point, but uh, vectors can be translated in parallel to each other. So that is a freedom that we have. So we can bring it over here, and we will see that it will always form a plane in different uh, directions. And that plane is something that is uh, very important uh, to ensure that the third vector that you're going to introduce is also not on that plane. It is uh, either perpendicular to that plane or making uh, either a non-zero mm, and non-90 degree angle as well. So similar to what we are talking about non-collinear, uh, sorry, non-orthogonal, you could have the non-orthogonality concept extended from two dimensions to now the third dimension as well, so that these three axes could, for example, be b1, b2, b3 going over here as unit vectors, right? Is this clear? Yeah, can 
I get rid of this? So let's um, look at this. This is again a very important concept I very briefly touched upon last time, but now that we have um, more information, we can write it a little more uh, rigorously than what we did last time. So we said that uh, the, uh, from Newton's second law we have this. Now we can say there is a particular coordinate system, let's say is this a dextral triad or not? Remember earlier I was writing x1 here, x2 here and x3 here. So I've kind of changed all of them, but is it still a dextral or not? So uh, those of you wondering, otherwise, uh, B2 cross B3, you would see is coming out of the board, and which is how we have drawn B1. So we treat it fine, right? So now, uh, for this uh, coordinate system, let's say we have a particle, think of a rigid body that we talked about earlier. Let's say we have a, a so a particle, let's say. A particle P of some uh, mass M, but in kinematics we would not be interested in about uh, interested about M. All of that information will be uh, embedded within. Uh, but um, we have a vector over here, which is your position vector of the particle P. With respect, let me call this as frame A now, an inertial frame of reference. So therefore, it's the position vector R of P. Okay. So position vector uh, R of, of, of P with respect to R. Oh, so it's the velocity that we, we have to write with respect to the reference frame. It's the position vector we write with respect to a point. Because we could have multiple points fixed on A, we could have could have one more point, let's say, uh, not necessarily on the axis either. I could have some arbitrary point over here, which is fixed with fixed with respect to A. A itself could be, let's say, a, a rigid body. Like I, it, it could be an aircraft, for example. Okay. So on the aircraft, you could fix either the uh, let's say the nose of the nose uh, tip of the nose of the aircraft or you could fix its CG, or uh, you could fix some point on the leading edge of the wing or the tail, etc. So uh, you have the freedom of which point in A you would like to take, and therefore, as far as the position vector is concerned, we have to specify the point as well, not just the frame of reference with respect to which you're taking. And it doesn't matter even if you change a frame of reference. Uh, let's say I have another frame of reference, uh, B, to which you have this, so you have, uh, let's say, a B1, B2, B3 over here, and like a A1, A2, A3 over here, right? Now, uh, I can, uh, even with respect to this frame, uh, the position vector still remains the same if it's with respect to O, right? So the point O is what we are tracking with respect to which what P is doing. So the frame of reference actually doesn't have an implication as far as R is concerned because R is not a derivative, okay? So whereas velocity and acceleration are derivatives, derivatives of a vector quantity with respect to a scalar quantity, and therefore uh, the frame with respect to which you take the derivative becomes critical and changing the frame will change the value of the velocity itself, okay? So, for example, if you are uh, while coming from Atlanta to here on the flight, if you are, let's say, walking on the aircraft, uh, you would see that you have a certain velocity with respect to the aircraft fixed uh, reference frame. Uh, 
uh, but you also have a, a, a velocity with respect to the ground fixed reference frame and obviously these two are very different from each other because the ground fixed reference frame will also take into account the aircraft's motion whereas uh, the velocity uh, with respect to the aircraft will not take uh, that motion, it will only take your motion with respect to the aircraft. Yeah. It depends on the origin, yes, but origin is a point, right? So, um, and I can take the position vector not necessarily from the origin, but any point in space, okay? And that point gets fixed um, uh, irrespective of which coordinate system you're going to use or which reference frame you're going to use because position is always of one point with respect to another point. It's immune to which frames of reference you have introduced or even if you have no frames of reference introduced at all, doesn't matter. So I have a vector, okay? In other words, I have a certain magnitude, I have a certain direction. Now, uh, the components of that vector or measure numbers of that vector will depend on whether I have introduced this frame or that frame, right? So uh, R itself, in this case, I can say probably x1, a1 plus x2, a2 plus x3, uh, a3. Um, but uh, for, for the same, from the same point O, if I'm looking at this OP, it's the same vector as far as this is concerned. I just have to do a uh, transformation of coordinates in order to get it, try, uh, get the measure numbers in terms of V1, V2, V3, especially if this is kind of rotated with respect to here. But the way I've drawn here, for, for example, just for uh, illustration sake, these are parallel to each other. So it doesn't matter where, it, where they are. But even if they were not parallel to each other, you had another uh, coordinate system, let's say C, which is somewhere else over here. Now, the measure numbers of R with respect to um, of the same uh, position vector, that is R of P with respect to O, the measure numbers uh, with respect to O, because O is a point that I can consider not, even though it, uh, it just happens to be the origin of this particular coordinate system that I've introduced, it's just a spatial point, okay? And that spatial point is visible from here, it's visible from here. And coordinate uh, and reference frames, mind you, um, are immune to being translated parallel to themselves. So in other words, I can just bring this without rotating, I can bring it such that this origin now coincides with O. Or I can bring this and make its origin coincide with O. I'm not changing anything with as far as the reference frames B to B and C are concerned, okay? So uh, uh, this is some uh, uh, property of reference frames that you have to understand that um, as long as it's a reference frame, which means also equivalently I can say it's a rigid body or a massless rigid body and their translations without a rotation uh, don't make any difference as far as the position vectors of any point with respect to any other point as long as those two points are fixed in space. Uh, so you're only translating these frames of reference and in fact we will do that uh, because it's more convenient to do that when you are actually uh, instead of uh, uh, measuring x1, um, let's say y1, y2, y3 along this, I can uh, take it over here and uh, make it same as x1, x2, x3. So for different problems, you would find it more convenient to locate the origin at different locations and by relocating the origin without rotating v1, v2, v3, I'm not changing anything with respect to the frame uh, B is concerned um, or if I do the same thing with respect to C, I'm not doing anything, uh, any changes to B or C. So they can be translated. Only when they are rotated then you have a different uh, uh, coordinate system that comes into it. Or for the same frame, um, let's say let's say you have an aircraft, you could have um, the aircraft fixed reference frame which is say, let's say one is parallel to the fuselage. Uh, the other is along the wing, the span of the wing, the third is um, perpendicular to those that plane formed by the first two, then I could have one coordinate system like that. The other could be along, uh, directed along the, uh, the, uh, the current velocity vector of the aircraft CG, okay? So uh, both of these uh, are uh, feasible um, uh, coordinate measures, but both are fixed to the aircraft. 
okay at that particular point in time they are fixed to the aircraft which means that you have um, the liberty of using either one of them depending upon which gives you um, uh, more uh, efficiency in the derivation or gives you more compact uh, final results for the quantities of interest maybe a velocity or an acceleration or an angular velocity angular acceleration angular momentum things like that that we will be deriving some uh, it's the same quantity but it will look the expression for it might look much bigger in a particular choice that you're making uh, as opposed to any other choice that you're making so uh, uh, this is an art that you learn as you start um, uh, solving problems you will see that uh, which which is more uh, kind of convenient to handle. There's uh, no hard and fast rule in terms of this is the right or wrong. As long as you have uh, made the transformations appropriately, they're all equivalent to each other. Just that uh, you're talking, uh, describing the same uh, uh, quantity in terms of uh, different sets of quantities. And obviously, you're going to have different results. But the overall thing remains the same. So the same with respect to this position vector. It's always going to be equal to x1 a1 plus x2 a2 plus x3 um, uh, a3. But um, if you look at it, if I want to, uh, if I rotate it as in the case of C, if there is C1, C2, C3, and um, I have measure numbers y1, y2, and y3, as I said, uh, there's nothing which changes if I bring this point, let's say, O. O C I call this as O A. So the way I've drawn the I've drawn these origins as different from each other, right? But I can move my O C to coincide with O. Nothing changes about C or nothing changes about A. And I would have, of course, um, the this particular vector now written in two different ways. One is, uh, let me write it separately over here. So, so this position vector of P with respect to OA, now that I'm bringing OC to coincide with OA, the distinction doesn't remain anymore. It is OA or OC. Or uh, if I bring all three together, of course, uh, V1, V2, Vc are parallel uh, to A1, A2, A3. So it's the exact same uh, thing. So it doesn't make a difference in this case. But even in this case, where I'm moving OC to coincide with OA, yeah. Good point, good point. Uh, so it, it's up to you. Uh, as long as you are consistent with that uh, throughout your derivation and how you use your results, um, it doesn't matter whether you want to uh, interchange them or uh, what, whatever, it doesn't matter. Because, see, at the end of the day, um, so now it doesn't matter whether it is OA or OC, or I, I just call it O, right? So it's the same point once I have moved this uh, over here. And I said that, uh, um, that that is something that you can do without any loss of information in general, right? So now this particular thing can uh, was originally being written as xi uh, a i, right? With the implied summation over i. Now uh, I want to measure it in terms of this uh, C system. So I can write this as y i. Right. So these two are actually equal to each other because it's from the same point to the same spatial point, another spatial point, but those points are not changing in either of these two cases. But the x1 need not be equal to y1, x2 need not be equal to y2, x3 need not be equal to y3, or they may not be jumbled up forms of each other. They could be entirely different set of numbers, what we call as the measure numbers. So this is these are the measure numbers of R. O in the A system, and these are the measure numbers Y, I are the measure numbers of the same vector in the C system, right? So this is, uh, again, something that you will keep uh, encountering every now and then, because when I say these two vectors are equal, what does it mean? Because a vector essentially is something which has a certain magnitude, in other words, there's a certain distance between O and P on a straight line. And 
which is also called as a displacement, uh, as opposed to a distance, which is a scalar quantity. A displacement is a vector, and I know that it is moving a particular. Oops. Uh, I hope the recording is uh, happening uh, even at that distance. Okay. So now um, I'm talking of uh, this vector uh, being unchanged, whether I look at it from the A system or the B system. All that it means that a vector, as you know, unlike a scalar, has two uh, points of information. One is um, it has a magnitude, it has a direction, right? So the magnitude is this distance or displacement from O to P. Uh, if you're talking of displacement, then you have to say the magnitude of the displacement. If you're saying the distance, it is a scalar already, right? So that is one quantity. The other is in which direction it is. And that direction is also kind of fixed over here. So in other words, these two are equal to each other. And from this, if I knew xi, ai, and ci, I will be able to determine my yi. Okay. So, so in terms of certain uh, trigonometric uh, quantities, typically uh, sines and cosines, uh, if you know the angle between these two systems, you will be able to very easily get that. And um, it's also very easy to get uh, those angles uh, by just taking the dot products of your ai and ci. So if you knew ai and ci, you just take the dot products of that, you know that you will end up with the angles between them. And so you, you can determine that angle uh, between these two systems arbitrary angles that we have drawn it uh, in this case, right? So is this clear now? Yeah? Right. Now, uh, yeah. So we come to this work energy, and we said that uh, in the previous class, uh, very uh, in a very loose way, we said that we are essentially multiplying this by a distance, right? But in reality, what is happening is that that distance that we are talking about is essentially a displacement that we are looking at. And therefore, this work that we are talking about is essentially f dotted with, dotted with ds. Right? So a displacement ds is taking place. So both are vectors. Uh, displacement is a vector. Force is a vector. And the work done by a force, as you know, uh, in uh, 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 common English language, we say is that it's the product of the magnitude of the force into the uh, distance moved by the point of application of the force parallel to the uh, force. Okay, so uh, so many words required to explain that, but in mathematics makes it much much simpler. You're saying that there is a certain displacement, there's a certain um, force. The work done by that is just the dot product of that because the dot, even if they are not at uh, not collinear with each other, not parallel to each other, they are at a certain angle, non-zero angle from each other, then what you're going to have is that once you take the dot product, you're going to have a cosine of that angle between them, and therefore you're going to get the component of one on the other, or equivalently this on this, right? So you can either think of it as a component of ds multiplying f, or a component of f multiplying ds uh, in the dot product sense or a scalar product sense, and that gives you your work done. And of course, we would be integrating that from a particular value of uh, initial uh, position as A to some uh, as B that you're talking about. The S A and B not to be confused with uh, the frames of reference that we introduced over here. right? So some, uh, let me use probably lower case A. Okay. So small uh, S small A, uh, S lower case A to S lower case B. So your integration of f d s is what we are going to be talking about there, which means that on the right-hand side, what you're going to have is an integration of m a d s. And once again, it's a dot product, because that's, that's what we're looking at. And to SA to SB, right? Now, yeah, this is a dot product. Oh, whenever I use a dot to get. Come again? Oh, OK, yeah. <laughs> right. So this is uh, coming <laughs> over here, which is your um, uh, the right-hand side of the same equation once it is uh, integrated with respect to the distance or displacement that uh, we are talking about over here. So now, 
this acceleration we already saw is nothing but the time derivative of the velocity. So in other words, we, have, we can write this acceleration as a dv by ds, sorry, dt, uh, with respect to a particular reference frame in which respect to which that uh, acceleration is being measured, right? So it is very important to see that this particular thing now can the, uh, the dt can be taken over to the ds. So your ds by dt is nothing but your velocity. So this whole thing you would see that just becomes m v dv, right? And when I integrate m v dv, you know that it's just linear in v, so it becomes half m v squared, right? Where we are essentially saying that uh, if there's no change in the potential energy that is happening, all of the work done that is uh, uh, on that particular point is essentially getting translated into its kinetic energy, uh, where, where, of course, we are talking of um, a non-dissipative system where there are no friction losses and uh, other damping losses or drag in the case of an aircraft, etc. So in that case, essentially, this is what uh, it translates into. So that's essentially your work energy is an integration with respect to the displacement field, which is essentially your spatial field of x1, x2, x3. And on the other hand, your impulse is the same thing instead of s, if I replace it by t. Of course, that is not a vector. So it is f dt. And there's no need for a dot product over there. I'm just multiplying a scalar quantity with respect to a vector. So in other words, let me write it separately over here. You have a force f and a scalar quantity dt. And you're essentially integrating from some time ta to eb. Right? So that is what we call as the impulse. Now we see that because we are multiplying a vector and a scalar, it remains a vector. Unlike here, where we are using two vector quantities and dotting them, therefore it was getting into a scalar. Yes, yes, of course, yeah, 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 good point, good point, yeah, good point. So I can call it as VB square minus V square. Thanks for pointing that out. Yeah, so um, I think that's kind of taken care of. Yeah, we were coming, uh, the so, so uh, in both cases, we are using the same starting point, which is Newton's second law. In one case, we're multiplying with a displacement, which is uh, a vector, and therefore you need to specify it as a dot product over there. In the other case, it is just a scalar quantity time with respect to which you're integrating, and you end up with what we call as, so this by definition is an impulse. An integration of a force over a period of time is essentially uh, called in English. And the same thing if you do for MA with DT, you would see that it becomes M D V because yeah. Over here? Yeah, yeah, good very, very good point. So essentially I'm saying that um, there is a particular point which is taking a particular path. Now I know that it need not be a uniform velocity. Uniform velocity is just one case of it, right? So as it moves from point A to point B, it is possible that its velocity is changing. Some parts it's faster, some parts it's slower, unlike our totters, right? So when we are having that uh, change in velocity, when you are integrating, you cannot bring the V out. But you are absolutely right in the special case where you have uniform motion, the speeds are constant, and therefore then you can bring the uh, V out over there, right? So uh, in any case, th this would have no meaning there when you are having a constant velocity, a dv uh, would make sense over there, right? So now, in this case, you are integrating with respect to time. So your right hand side also gets integrated with respect to time. Um, 
again from TA to TB to instants of time. Right? Now, once again, I can write my acceleration as dV by dT with respect to some particular frame of reference. And you see that your uh, dT gets cancelled. You just have m dV. And if m is constant, you have it as m into vb minus va right which is nothing but mass into velocity what is that you familiar with yeah yeah exactly so that's why it's a relationship between impulse and momentum right so there's a, a change of momentum that is happening which is equal to the impulse we call this as iva so essentially going from a to b there is a certain um, impulse that is uh, being imposed on uh, the pa particle and the, which is causing its momentum to change, right? Uh, here, of course, it was put in a uh, much subtler way. The rate of change of momentum that you're going to have is equal to the force that is applied. Now, you're, uh, because you're integrating with respect to time, it's no longer a rate, but it's actual change of momentum, which is equal to the impulse that is applied. Now, um, this is where it's very interesting that uh, in the Indian way of thinking uh, of these things, the ancient Indian scriptures, uh, there's the same word, um, of course there are uh, alternate words also, but the same word kala we say for both time and space. So that essentially means that uh, as far as the mathematics is concerned also, we know that the both of these, whether it's x1, x2, x3 on the one hand, or t on the other hand, these are independent variables. Now. You're moving from, uh, just like you were moving from rectilinear motion 1D, uh, planar motion 2D, uh, motion uh, in space, which is 3D. Now, essentially, when you're, something is changing with respect to time, there's a change uh, with respect to time as an additional independent variable. X1, X2, X3, T, you have a four-dimensional space in which you're moving, okay? So as far as the mathematics is concerned, it's very clearly all of these are independent variables with respect to which you are essentially talking about the um, position or velocity or any other quantity, acceleration, impulse, momentum, etc. And all of these are uh, having very, very similar connotations and that's why you have the same word kala which is referred to uh, in both these places. We'll uh, get into a few of those similarities as well in the next class um, probably, but uh, right now it's very important to see that these two very, very commonly used methodologies. One is the work energy principles. Again, they could take on many different forms. I only mentioned two examples in the previous class, which are um, the uh, Lagrangian and Hamiltonian approaches. But there are many, many others as well, variational principles as we generally call them. And impulse momentum, again, it could take on various forms. But uh, at the very basic end of it, all that you're doing is you're taking up Newton's second law and integrating it with respect to one of the in, uh, one set of the independent variables. Either it's the spatial variables, because there are more than one of them, you have a vector product over there, which is essentially a uh, dot product, but uh, giving rise to a scalar. But in the other case, you're having a scalar which is multiplying because time, there's only one time that you're interested in, and that you're multiplying and integrating over a range that uh, you're interested in. So uh, uh, these are, in other words, equivalent, uh, which is what I uh, uh, said in passing last time as uh, the seed and the tree or uh, the chicken and egg. Uh, you, you, uh, because we have learned this first and then we are uh, introducing this, we are saying that uh, these two are coming from that, but uh, through an integration. But the reverse of integration is essentially differentiation. So you can start with these equations and you can take its derivative with respect to time and eventually, uh, or this with respect to a gradient with respect to space, and you will end up with the force equal to mass into acceleration. So they are inverse relationships of each other, and sometimes one is more convenient to use than the other, uh, for the, but for the same problem, depending upon the user, uh, you can choose whichever method and eventually if you're working it out properly and consistently, you will end up with the same results for all the quantities of interest, right? Uh, I think I've kind of done with that. So the final thing, of course, is the uh, dynamics of the rigid body uh, in three dimensions, which is just an extension of 
uh, whatever we will be doing here uh, in planar motion. So we will be just uh, bringing in an additional X uh, into picture and uh, some of the things become a little more complicated when you do that, especially related to the rotations and how they transform, etc. So I think that's kind of So this is something that I already sent you over email, but um, I just want to uh, uh, get to the points that uh, are highlighted over here. It was very clear in uh, your presentation uh, earlier uh, in this class uh, where uh, you're taking advantage of, as you said, chat GPT, et cetera, and also uh, your own using your own intuition as well along with that in order to uh, make this whole thing fun, uh, which is, uh, which, and also the fact that we are doing it collaboratively so because we are not really so much concerned about competing with each other but trying to bring out the best. The reason why I am doing all of this is to um, uh, we get some of the best students in Indian Institute of Science which is uh, uh, ranked number one in the country um, and uh, many of them uh, go through uh, the courses over here end up with very good grades but when they are interviewed by the aerospace industry a common complaint that we get is in terms of their uh, non-suitability in terms of uh, being ready for the uh, what the industry wants and therefore a very long period of training typically is has to be invested by the companies on uh, such graduates so it's very important for us to get uh, into a phase with the way the industry works. For example, in the industry, you're not going to be competing except for your probably your promotions or something with your colleagues. You're typically, most industry problems are so complex that you can't uh, usually solve it individually. You have to work in teams. You have to collaborate, not only at the same location, but multiple locations by virtually collaborating with them. And that's how some massive big products or big leaps in the industry are essentially made. Uh, so that is one thing. The other thing is, in terms of access to information, obviously uh, your boss in the industry is not going to say, no, you're not supposed to use this particular books, you're not supposed to use this reference to solve your problem. Um, he's going to say, use whatever resources you have at hand, I want this solved in a certain amount of time uh, so that we can take it forward in terms of a product development or whatever, right? So uh, in terms of the limitations we typically put at the uh, educational level in terms of an exam being of a so rigorously of a let's say a three hour uh, period in which you have to finish it you should not uh, talk to each other about it and things like that many of these things are kind of becoming slowly outdated uh, people uh, are resistant especially professors like us are resistant to the particular change uh, but wherever we see that people are moving towards and adapting these new uh, ways of working around the world uh, the students are the ones who eventually benefit a lot and that is uh, the reason why I'm saying that let's take advantage of all the resources at your hand uh, and try to work in a team and try to come up with something as good as possible in the time that we have. Uh, of course, again, times are limited in the sense that you have to uh, submit it at the next class, but essentially it is much more, much less stringent compared to uh, an exam in which you're really uh, pushed towards uh, doing things much faster than what you would normally do. Uh, it's more important to do it in a little more relaxed manner. Of course, in the industry also, it's very important that uh, you want to take your product to the market much before the competing uh, industry uh, element is doing that, another company A, a versus B. Th those competitions do exist, but it's not the kind of a rat race between individuals that uh, we co commonly tend to see in educational systems. Um, of course, when we have much larger classes, it becomes kind of essential to do that. But in a small class like this, it makes much more sense for all of you to uh, collaborate, cooperate, and come up with this. And um, uh, that's one of the takeaways. Of course, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, homework that you just presented, um, it of course has uh, the dynamic analogy, but it also has uh, for our own life in terms of how uh, the team 
collaboration can typically come up with much better um, uh, results than the sum of the results of individual uh, contributions, right? So that is essentially what we are trying to take forward, and that's why we want to become better than ourselves and uh, not better than somebody else. Uh, so that way, automatically, we become better than others if, we, if that is somebody's goal. But uh, what is more important is to improvise upon yourself. And um, therefore, uh, we are going to be doing this learning. And it was very interesting the way you presented. I'll come up with some uh, on that later when I present my own uh, interpretations of that. But uh, uh, essentially, uh, it's very, uh, I'm not just saying this for the heck of saying it, that it's uh, not your learning, but our learning. Because uh, I found uh, throughout my uh, almost a quarter century of teaching that teaching is the best way to learn. And um, uh, because when you're teaching, especially bright students like you from Georgia Tech or Indian Institute of Science, you are um, you ask the kind of questions that you ask, the interactions that we have, the different perspectives that you bring when you make a presentation on your homework. All of this adds to uh, how I perceive the problem. Because uh, no particular person can, however simple the problem, can perceive all angles to that pro particular problem. Uh, different individuals perceive it differently, and each one of them has its own advantages or disadvantages, and then we, for various purposes, and we can uh, benefit from each other's perspectives of the same uh, problem, which is what uh, we will continue to do. And then, uh, yeah. So as I said um, in the previous class itself and also over the email, that we are not going to be following any textbook. But uh, JPR was kind enough to uh, present me with this uh, book uh, last Monday. I just unwrapped it yesterday. And um, it seems to be a nice book. So um, you, of course, have uh, through VPN and Georgia Tech Library, you have access to downloading uh, any of the books, and uh, including this. McGill and King War, in fact, uh, Georgia Tech professors uh, in the past. Um, and um, uh, the topics, if you're looking at what we will be covering in this particular course, I was just trying to correlate uh, between um, uh, what is there in your book. I will not be following the book, but um, in case you would like to look at an alternate way of uh, perceiving the same thing, then you can, uh, when we uh, refer to each of these topics, you can see uh, those particular chapters that uh, we will be invoking as far as the book is concerned uh, without actually reading it. So uh, these are two things that uh, we already talked about in passing. This is essentially your Newton's second law, but now we are talking about multiple forces acting on the same particle, and you have to sum over the, uh, all of those forces in an algebraic sense, a vector sum of that, and that gives you the uh, time derivative of the momentum, the rate of change of momentum. Uh, once again, mm, uh, uh, in your book also I see that uh, it's typically not done, but it's very important that, uh, as we discussed earlier today, uh, it's very important to specify the frame of reference with respect to which we take derivative, okay? So uh, we take whatever is good in everything. We don't kind of criticize what is what is there uh, because some certain things might be understood because in a problem you might not be defining any other reference frame than A. It's understood that all derivatives of time with re of vectors with respect to time are with respect to that frame. It, it might be uh, less... Um, it might be ergonomic rather to um, not write A explicitly and, and say that it's understood that it is A. But where you are dealing with more than one frame of reference in a particular problem, very, very important that you specify um, with respect to which frame you're taking a time derivative or a space derivative, whatever. But as long as the numerator is a vector, you have to specify this. So this is very, very critical, and I'll be uh, observing this in your future homeworks as well when we go about doing that. So it's important that you take that into account. Now, this is just a generalization of that. We already talked about that in passing, that a rigid body has not just three translations as its degrees of freedom, but also three rotations um, in non-collinear directions. And therefore, you have an equivalent of this, which is essentially the moments are equal to uh, a moment of inertia over here into an angular acceleration over here. So instead of the acceleration or rate of change of the momentum that you have, you are having a rate of change of angular momentum that you have. So this I omega is nothing but angular momentum. J 
just as this is translational momentum. And um, when you're having uh, particles, you're dealing only with particles and not rigid bodies, uh, or any bodies for that matter, then you are um, uh, only interested in this particular equation. It's only when you bring in uh, bodies into picture, um, uh, whether it is rigid or otherwise, you have to take into account your um, moment equation as well. So this is just a generalized form of this. So uh, one minute, I'll come to you. So this is essentially a generalization from translation to rotations. Yes, please, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, this makes sense because, see, even here, I would say that this is not necessarily equal to m dv by dt. Can you think of an example where that is true? Excellent, yeah. So, uh, in aerospace, you have an example of the rocket where you know that the propellant is getting burnt and therefore the weight of the rocket as it moves up is getting reduced, right? So it's not only V which is changing, but M is also changing. Uh, so it's very important to understand that uh, what we are interested in is not M dV by dt, but a d by dt of the momenta, uh, which we typically will call as P. Let me go forward later on. Um, and uh, the angular momenta, we will typically use H to refer to this. This is a notation that we will use uh, going forward. It's not necessary that you remember right now. We will uh, go visit as we go. There. So uh, good that you pointed out why this not equal to sign is written because uh, this is uh, assuming that I doesn't change, but it is possible that I is changing with time and therefore uh, there is a not. Uh, so uh, this was equal, then you would have to add another term, which is uh, essentially your I dot with omega, right? I'm using the same notation, but you know, angular velocity is a vector, right? Uh, M is the torque, yeah. So, um, so we will be talking of various forms of it. So essentially, just like force, it's a vector. So it has three components, F1, F2, F3. Here it is M1, M2, M3. So uh, we might be calling it by different names. For example, you have this, um, let us say, if I'm uh, applying, a, it's like a shaft, and I'm trying to twist it like this, so that's a, that you, then you would call it a torque. But if I were trying to do this, I'm bending it, right? So then you would call it a bending moment, okay? So we will not be considering that in this course, but in your future courses, which are required courses uh, at Georgia Tech for your undergraduate program, you will be considering that. So uh, in this case, the three components that we have, vectors, M1, M2, M3, um, along B1, B2, B3, if I introduce B1 along the length, B2 and B3 along the width and the height, then you're, what you're saying is right, that this we will call as a torque, right? But these two we will call as a bending moment, right? But essentially from a mathematical perspective, they're all the same. You can call it a moment, you can call it a torque, you can call it a couple because I can take M1, whatever its magnitude is, M2, whatever its magnitude is, M3, whatever its magnitude is, and get the resultant of them and call it M, which is what I'm writing over here, right? So that M, now about that axis, it is a torque. So essentially you're right, okay? So, but once we start um, uh, nitpicking on in terms of how exactly it is uh, on this, uh, related to the geometry of the structure, we tend to give different uh, nomenclature to it in English. But mathematically speaking, you're absolutely right. So I think it's 45, so we'll uh, close down. So no homework this time. Have a great weekend, uh, for the first weekend here. So have a great time.